Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, this is the final session of the launch of the University of California Center for Climate, Health and Equity. For those of you who have joined us over the past two days, it's been an incredible series of events with just tremendous wisdom and leadership shared by all of our speakers. And for those of you who are newly joining us, um, please visit our website to learn more about the center and view recordings of our, our past events. Just as a quick reminder, um, the University of California Center for Climate, Health and Equity brings together the leadership and expertise of faculty, staff and students across all 10 University of California campuses to drive ambitious climate action that prioritizes health and equity through our pillars of research, education, health system sustainability, and policy, we are working to uplift climate solutions that foster healthy communities and a healthier planet for future generations. In this final panel of our launch event, we have the honor of hearing from policymakers and experts from all levels, from the city to the state to our national government about the innovative policy work they are leading to address climate change, protect public health, and promote equity. So to get us started, I am most honored to introduce our first speaker, Assemblywoman Luz Rivas, who represents California District 39. Assemblywoman Rivas was elected into the California State Assembly in 2018. And since then, she has been appointed as the chair of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources, and currently serves on the Assembly Committees on Budget, Health, Local Governments, Revenue and Taxation, and the Joint Legislative Committee on Emergency Management. She is also the Chair of the Select Committee on the Nonprofit Sector and serves on the Select Committee on Latina Inequalities and Select Committee on Coastal Protection and Access to Natural Resources. During her time in the Assembly, she has been an extraordinarily successful leader in de delivering substantive policy, including on homelessness, education, creating the California Youth Empowerment Commission, and advocating for environmental justice through her role as the chair of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. So thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have one of California's really leading advocates on climate policy with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Assemblywoman Luz Rivas. I represent the 39th Assembly District, which is in the East San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. I'm excited to be here with you to speak on the opening of this new center um, on climate health and equity. Uh, you know, this center is the first of its kind to address how these, uh, the issues of climate change, public health and equity all are connected. And um, a lot of my work in the legislature has been at those the you know the connections of those issues equity climate change, especially now that I'm chair of the Assembly Natural Resources Committee. Uh, this is a great opportunity for research that will focus on uh, you know climate and how it affects our most vulnerable populations. My district right now in the San Fernando Valley is bearing the brunt. Of, of climate change. And we're not necessarily the ones that are causing it, right? Um, and increasing the emissions, but because of, you know, more extreme heat events, um, other things that are happening, um, our constituents are suffering um, from climate change and its effects. Um, you know, it's a urban, urban heat island, um, you know, in, in my district, uh, lots of people um, don't have air conditioning or very, you know, the tree canopy, unfortunately, is lacking. Um, and those are things I think that we need to work on and understand more of how the state could respond um, to these issues. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember my mom used to take us to the mall because we had no air conditioning in our home. And it was just too hot in the San Fernando Valley, right? And unfortunately, we still have a lot of families and vulnerable populations that are suffering um, especially during extreme heat weather events. Um, and we need to do more um, in, in the policy area too. Uh, and so I'm very excited um, to have been here to be here at the launch of this center, looking forward um, um, how this center can inform policy in the state of California. And I will be a partner with you. And I, I know I have a lot of other colleagues 
that will be excited to see your research and how we can turn it into action at the state level. So thank you again for having me here. Thank you, Assemblywoman Rivas, for these remarks and for your support as we launch this center. We do look forward to collaborating with you and many of your colleagues um, to, to bring our, our research into, into action at the state level. Um, we now have a fantastic panel of policymakers who are going to dig deeper into the ways that they're bringing health equity into climate policymaking. And our discussion today will be moderated by Colleen Callahan, the co-executive director of the Luskin Center for Innovation at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. So Colleen, I will hand it to you. Great, thank you so much, Naomi. And thank you to the assembly member for those really inspiring and um, important remarks. Um, and moreover, for her leadership, um, including for a public health and equity centered approach to extreme heat. Um, congrats to, to you, Naomi, and others behind the UC Center for Climate, Health, and Equity on your impactful launch event series. Oh, throughout these past two days, you've brought together such a fantastic group of speakers and participants. And per the center's mission, you're already connecting the health sector policymakers and others to help advance equitable health center and climate action during this really critical window in time. Building upon that last panel um, earlier this afternoon on climate and mental health, I know I'm not alone in feeling the need for collaborative hope and regenerative inspiration during what feels like very heavy weeks, months, if not years that we've been in, right? So it's the people supporting this new UC Center and all of you on today that give me energy to keep doing my part in the collective fight for climate solutions. Some of my health and climate heroes are on this next panel of government leaders that I have the honor of moderating. So we're joined in alphabetical order by Dr. John Balvis, Interim Director at the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity within the US Department of Health and Human Services. We're also joined by Louise Bedsworth, Executive Director of the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at UC Berkeley, and Shereen DeSouza, Deputy Secretary for Climate Policy and Intergovernmental Relations at the California Environmental Protection Act, as well as Veronica Eady, Senior Deputy Executive Officer of Policy and Equity at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and last but not least, Martha Segura, Climate Mobilization Officer at the City of Los Angeles. So we don't have much time. So I'm gonna refer you to bio links, which I think will be coming in the comment thread to learn more about these illustrious panelists. The format of the panel will be three questions that each speaker will have just one or, three, or two to three minutes for a question to address. So it'll be a lightning rod style. Um, and let's get started. Um, it's clear that um, it's clear that climate action is gonna be needed at all levels. Um, of government um, and, and really every sector. So each of you are working at different levels of government to advance climate solutions that involve health and uh, bringing health into climate policy or bringing climate into health policy. So let's start at the local level. Marta, in your role with the city of LA, I see you as an inclusive bridge builder, mm -hmm. right? You're uplifting the voices of underrepresented frontline residents into climate planning and policy as well as taking an all government approach that involves collaborating across city agencies and across cities. In LA and beyond, how are cities innovating and leading equity focused climate work? Well, I think LA and, and quite a few other cities are leading the way and now focusing on the social vulnerability of their communities and looking at the communities that have um, historically suffered from health disparities. And that's why I love the, the title of your new center, uh, Climate, Health, and Equity are really the pillars by which we need to look at this, this, this challenge, this, this overwhelming challenge, because if we don't look at all three of those factors simultaneously, we might miss something. We have in the past when we just focus on, say, technologically driven solutions or market driven solutions that we think will address um, climate, but then we 
forget to look at the other metrics, which are equity and health. And I think that's where our office is innovating. We're, we're definitely focused on a social equity lens. We're building bridges with other jurisdictions, other municipalities like LA County. We're also building bridges with the state and the federal government. But more importantly, we're engaging voices of community. And we have a blueprint by which to elevate their voices to co-design and co-shape policy, um, equitable climate policy for the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Veronica, um, you're next. Uh, after a state leadership role, you're now leading uh, regional air quality work with an environmental justice focus. So how can regional air quality policy engage communities in climate action in a way that truly advances health equity? Well, I'll start by um, saying I agree with everything that Martha said, and I think that that um, the city of LA's approach is relevant on every level of the work. Um, for a regulatory agency, um, it's a particular challenge to us to kind of allow um, uh, communities to lead and to allow for a kind of um, environmental democracy in this work. So um, when I talk to my colleagues in our agency and other, air, uh, other agents, agencies, government agencies, I try to urge them to, um, first of all, um, get comfortable with the idea of sharing power with community, which I think is um, on the way to, you know, it's one step before allowing communities to lead and giving them the tools that they need um, and the resources that they need to be able to make their own decisions, even um, funding decisions. Um, and as we, you know, start to lose a little or cede our power, there is this level of discomfort. This is doing um, our work in a way that it hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, as we approach this authentically, um, we need to allow for that discomfort. Um, it's normal, it's, it's growing, um, and we need to sit with it for a minute. Um, there are other things um, associated, you know, with involving communities and making it convenient for uh, community members to be able to come to meetings. Um, and I think that probably all of us are doing a little bit of that, you know, having our meetings in the evening, um, um, you know, uh, paying um, or uh, providing meals or, or, or babysitting um, as we um, have these um meetings with the community where the community is in the lead. Um, though um, the last thing that I will say is that um, across the state of California, there has been a, um, a step further to um, actually create um, chairs in or seats on government agencies that are designated for communities. So you've seen that in a number of air districts um, throughout the state. You've seen it in San Diego. Um, I think it's happening in the South Coast, in the LA region, um, and that's something that we need to be doing um, in the Bay Area. We haven't done it yet, um, but it's all part of changing the paradigm, um, creating leadership, acknowledging the lived experiences of community members, and um, learning from that. Um, and I'll just say, well, this is my, I promise, my last thing that I'll say is that um, I love that this center is opening. I'm, I'm, I love that we're having this panel. Um, some of the things that we struggle with are um, community-based participatory research, um, which are incredibly important to the work and to our service to communities, um, and also participatory budgeting, which is maybe the thing that makes people feel the most uncomfortable, but um, having budgets where um, that are completely transparent to the community, but also that they'll be able to fund um, their priorities. So I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah, those are important best practices. Thank you. Shireen, California is known for leading on climate mitigation, was ahead of the curve, um, and has more recently been focusing on adaptation, an area that you've contributed to on an international stage. What can other states in the world learn from both California's successes and challenges on climate action? Thanks, Colleen. And before I dive into that question, just want to say huge congratulations to Naomi and the rest of the CCHE team on launching this exciting center. Um, really happy to be part of this conversation and really looking forward to collaborating with the center um, over the coming months and years. 
I think there's a lot of good, uh, good work we'll be able to advance together. Uh, but Colleen, back to your question, I think there's a lot California can teach the rest of the world, and we also have a lot to learn. Um, one of the exciting parts of my role is to work with other jurisdictions on sharing knowledge and experiences. Uh, one lesson I think we can share, you know, in comparing my work with the state to the international adaptation work I did uh, for the federal government, for the State Department, um, one lesson I think that California really is that California really tries to focus on advancing equity through our climate efforts. So if you look at the CARB scoping plan process, for example, you'll see that there's um, an EJ advisory committee that engages really heavily in that process. Similarly, the update to the state adaptation strategy, which uh, was just completed in the last month, um, has a concerted focus on addressing equity. Um, you'll also note that over 50% of the proceeds from the sale of uh, state-owned cap-and-trade allowances are spent on mitigation projects benefiting disadvantaged communities. Um, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that the scoping plan, once it's finalized at the end of this year, this will be the first actionable plan in the world by an economy as large as ours, the fifth, uh, fifth largest economy in the world on how to achieve carbon neutrality. And I can almost guarantee that other jurisdictions around the world will look to this plan as guidance for how they figure out how to achieve the carbon neutrality targets that, uh, that everyone is setting at this point, or many jurisdictions are setting. Um, one other approach that I think California takes and, I, and that is unique is this whole of government approach to addressing climate. And this is really evident in the governor's historic $47 billion proposed climate budget that was announced uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And that 40, $47 billion combines $15 billion that was enacted last year, as well as $32 billion proposed for the 22-23 budget cycle. And um, the, the budget the climate budget includes a focus on all of the usual climate suspects, the Energy Commission, the Air Resources Board, the Transportation Agency, but it also includes a heavy focus on mainstreaming climate in health, education, and uh, workforce development. And this is really in recognition that climate touches every aspect of our life and every sector must be part of the solution. Um, one last lesson I'll highlight from California's approach is an effort to integrate mitigation and adaptation, effort, adaptation efforts wherever possible um, to essentially feed two birds with one seed. Um, and a good example of this is the wildfire work we're doing. Obviously, the resilience, uh, the adaptation, the need to adapt to wildfire, that I, I don't need to explain that. But at the same time, reducing wildfire means we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So there's an important kind of uh, integrated adaptation mitigation benefit there with that, those activities. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and of course, it, um, the integration of, of health benefits and, and, and the GHG reduction climate benefits um, is also really central, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, John, the new HHS Office for Climate Change and Health Equity, which you now lead, is the first of its kind at the federal level. We'd love to hear about your vision for national action on climate and health policy and how we in California can work with your new office. Great. Thanks, Colleen. And uh, let me start also by just congratulating Naomi and the center and, and Drs. Tarani and Weiser for, for as founding co-directors for this very exciting development at UCSF. And, um, you know, our vision um, is probably similar to the center because our names are kind of similar. The vision for our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity uh, is to, to do the pivot to action, right? To integrate climate action into health and human services, not just the healthcare system, but also the human services side of HHS, and especially mainstreaming climate actions on all the work that's going on in health equity. And there's a tremendous amount of investment going on now from the federal down to the local level uh, post COVID in, in health equity. Very much of it aligns with what we need to do to build resilience against climate effects. We're raising that awareness and trying to channel that. Uh, and at the same time, you know, we're working within the federal government to elevate health within climate policy. Um, health has been a part, health, the word health will appear, but um, the actual listening to the health messaging, the actual recognition that the health benefits of climate actions 
create economic value that's greater than the cost of those actions is something that still isn't recognized somehow. So we're looking to elevate health within, within the world of climate policy. You know, I think it, our, our vision's best exemplified by the commitments we made at COP26 to, to make re the communities in this nation resilient against climate health effects, to have the health sector walk the walk, starting with the Federal Health Center, which we uh, created a learning network for the VA DOD, for the you know, veterans and the Department of Defense, the Indian Health Service to, to decarbonize. And then, um, you know, to, to, to create the, the runway to create that pathway for the private health sector to, to meet the Biden administration goals of 50% reduction in emissions by 2030, net zero by 2050. Um, all of this, you know, relies on getting the federal resources, you know, down to the, the neediest health systems, to our, our, our essential hospitals, to the hospitals that are caring for uh, the, the communities bearing the greatest burden of health disparities, and also getting those human services uh, down to the local level where, where that's needed. And that's too, there's a lot to unpack in that, but that's, that's our vision, is that it really translates all the way down to that level. In terms of California, it's do what you do, leadership and innovation, right? Um, you're leading the way in this space. The California Department of Public Health um, is a year ahead of us in having an Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. You're doing great work with asset framing, great work with data systems, great work with, uh, with with the policy, and so uh, you know, and just today I was on a call with uh, with um, regional and and state and and Sacramento based individuals who are creating a model resilience hub uh, in Sacramento and and tying it into the health system. So you know, mm. those creating those models of innovation, documenting, uh, evaluating, and uh, uh, you know, using that forty seven billion dollars, wow, um, wisely. Uh, is 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 the path. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we are actually amazingly slightly ahead of schedule. <laughs> this is so often these panels go uh, uh, the opposite way. But so in, in just one minute, can you just tell us a little bit more about kind of what is the power of your office to affect change in, in, uh, towards that vision that you outlined? You know, the power of our office is really uh, the power of the leadership of this administration. So we have Secretary Becerra, we have Admiral Levine, the Assistant Secretary for Health, squarely behind the efforts that we're doing. Our office, you know, our office um, is building, we're new, uh, but we have outstanding technical expertise. We have outstanding passion in the staff that we have, the few staff that we have. So we bring to the rest of HHS expertise, ideas, vision, uh, and we have the backing uh, at the highest levels, uh, and, and and you know so so that's that's the power of the office. We don't have much in the way of budget. We don't have much in the way of regulatory authority, but we have the about the ability to convene and to provide the vision and the path and and to meet you know the rest of HHS and and other federal agencies you know halfway to to help them identify you know, the highest priority and impactful actions they can do. And, and we're doing that. Thank you for your leadership there. Uh, Luis, uh, connect the dots for us. So you've been involved in setting California's climate policy, as well as developing local climate programs, such as the transformative climate communities program that's becoming a national model. So if you could reflect back for us, since you got involved many years ago, what has changed in the way the state is thinking about climate change and specifically the integration of health equity into kind of the climate change, um, climate policy discussion and what still needs to be done? Great, well, thank you, Colleen. And yes, I'll just share in every, with everyone else and congratulating uh, the team here for launching this center. And I can say we are very excited to be working with you all over the coming years um, and across the whole UC system. Um, so that's a great question. And I think it's a really, you know, what's great about California's climate policy is going back to the very first actions. And we go back to the early 2000s. Uh, those were grounded in the state's authority under the Clean Air Act, which is rooted in public health. So public health has been the driving factor for, you know, that has led the state's action, and that is the authority that the state has had. And so it's always been that grounding piece, but I think you have seen a really interesting evolution over the last you know, 20 years, where we're starting to see a lot more of an integrated approach. So 
when the Strategic Growth Council was created back in 2008. It was really about how do we bring together all of the state agencies that touch on sustainable communities. And when we look at that, you realize why an all of government approach is needed. You have transportation, housing, health, uh, natural resources, environmental protection, food and agriculture, all coming to the table, and also members of the public as well. And so the idea was really to build that collaborative space. And I think increasingly we have seen that. And I think the climate budget is another evolution of that approach where it is not no longer just a cap and trade budget. It is really how do we take climate action and spread it throughout all of our government's um, uh, you know, resources and actions. So I think those are really important evolutions that have happened. Uh, I would also say, I think as you look back when the state first established um, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets and looked at how are we going to achieve them, they established a climate action team. And back in the early 2000s, the Department of Public Health was not on that climate action team at the very beginning. And now I think you've seen that this through the state's health and all policies work and other initiatives, just how critical um, all of the social determinants of health are. And I think that is also reflected in our climate approach. Uh, so I just, I really think the evolution has been increasingly towards more cross-cutting approaches, uh, integration of emission reduction and building resilience as Shireen alluded to. Uh, so I just think you're really seeing this evolution to mainstreaming climate and making it touch on all of the factors that we know affect how we're going to achieve our climate goals, but also how we're going to protect people and communities in the face of change and in the transition to cleaner economy. Right. Thank you, Luis. And uh, for anyone uh, listening in who is not really familiar with the state's Strategic Growth Council, I encourage you to check out um, just the, the programs that I, 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 I feel like there's just so many model programs um, that the rest of the nation can learn from, including the Transformative Climate Communities program I mentioned. Um, so thank you for, for yeah, talking about kind of your reflections there. Um, I'm going to pivot now to the next uh, question. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll start again with you and then kind of go in reverse order, at least. So what are the big policy questions that you see coming up either for how our health system should better respond to the climate crisis or how health considerations should drive climate investments? Well, I think what's really interesting and I think was sort of talked, a lot of us touched on the important role of partnership and community um, engagement. And I think um, as you look at the health sector and public health in particular is driven by a very community-based approach and community partnership approach to achieving results. Um, so I think as we look at the policy challenges, and if you think about it in the context of a new center focusing on this, it's critical of how are we doing work and turning that work into solutions rapidly and at a scale that are going to make an impact and a difference. And so when I think about, um, you know, how something like a new, this new center at UC can help, it's how do we build those partnerships? How can the health system be a part of building those partnerships and really helping to accelerate solutions out into communities? So I see it as a really important interface uh, between the work that is happening, the policy and the research, and then people and communities. Thank you. John, how, how can our health systems better respond to the climate crisis? And what can you do to really push that change? Thanks. So um, actually, I did want to go back to the question you asked me before, too, which was how does a little office like ours actually get anything done? And I answered the question from where we are now, which is in a state of kind of extreme um, scant resources. Um, but as our support builds, the other things that an office like ours can do is to do mini grants and to actually see that innovation and to put money out into the communities to do that kind of model integration, just along the lines of what Louise was talking about, um, as well as to engage in strategic partnerships with the national associations of you know, city and county health officials and state health officials and emergency managers, et cetera, to kind of explore, build out those models, assess the gaps and, and you know, create those learning networks for best practices among the states and the cities in their use of federal resources. So I just wanted to embellish that a little bit. Um, 
you know, this is kind of the big policy question, right? So I think there, there's there's two areas of the big policy. One is we're in this shift of paradigms from, um, you know, preparedness and response. And most of that is response to the recognition that if we're only focusing on response and having the batteries charged and the diesel generators, that we're just going to be constantly doing that in a world of increasingly frequent and severe kind of weather events. We have to get up ahead of that into the resilience space and risk mitigation. And you see FEMA doing this uh, in a very significant way right now. And that's where the health sector comes in. That's where, you know, the existence of the community health centers, the existence of the community health workers in you know, on the streets, in, in, in the communities themselves, can build that long-term resilience. The same kind of resilience that we need for disasters, that we need for heat waves, is exactly the same kind of addressing the social determinants of health and reduction of health disparity. It's the same, you know, getting at those upstream forces that put people in harm's way of climate change is what puts people in harm's way of the social factors too. So so that's one of the, the, the big is, you know, big changes is, um, you know, linking up that long-term risk mitigation and resilience building to the health equity agenda. Um, and, and then second is that, you know, I'll, I'll, the, the most sustainable is making this sustainable long-term, right? It can't just be one off this, you know, in, in, our, in our political cycles. The most sustainable health system is gonna be the one that, del, you know, that, that, that gets out of the paradigm of de delivering more and more services, right? has to be a paradigm of delivering less and less service. That's the most sustainable health service is the least energy used, right? So, um, you know, that's where the health system, that's, that's where the health policy world needs to go is, is where it is now in a sustained way, focusing on the primary drivers of ill health, focusing on equitable access to safe food, clean air, healthy food, uh, you know, green space, recreational activities, active living, for everybody in order to be able to provide less care for the diabetes, asthma, hypertension, depression, anxiety, and so on. Thanks, stop there. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's that's a lot, but thank you <laughs> for sharing that. Um, all, all really important uh, work that needs to be done there, of course. Shireen, um, gosh, California has, has really set some ambitious but I would say achievable goals for itself that of course come with a lot of challenges. And the scoping plan represents an important milestone, but also of course has been met with a, a wide a ver, direct, a ver, a kind of diversity of um, reactions to it. Um, di people have different opinions on kind of how fast the state needs to move. Um, what are what do you see as kind of the biggest challenges or kind of biggest policy questions um, driving climate investments? Thanks, Colleen. And uh, just very quickly before I speak to that question, um, I wanted to note Luis uh, brought up a minute ago that when the climate action team was first established many years ago, um, the Department of Public Health wasn't part of it. And I'm so grateful for the folks who have been with the state who, who may, you know, advocated for the importance of including health and just wanted to note that we have a climate action team meeting coming up just next week. And one of the main presenters is the Department of Public Health uh, talking about some of the health equity work that they're doing. So it's exciting to, uh, to, to see that um, full circle um, shift that has happened. Um, anyway, so you were you were asking, I think, about um, what the state can do to drive in investments in climate. Am I am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, and I mean, just what are what are the big kind of challenges that the the state will face where research can help inform hopefully solutions? Because yeah. we haven't figured it all out, right? We don't know exactly how we're going to achieve our ambitious climate goals. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question, and. Um, to be completely candid, I don't know. I, I'm I'm scared. <laughs> I am scared when I look at the draft scoping plan that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, the 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 scenario that um, CARB staff are recommending is one that achieves climate neutrality in 2045 at the latest. Right? There was also modeling done on 2035 carbon neutrality in 2035. 
There's, of course, the 2030 target of 40% uh, below 1990 levels. It's going to be really hard. It is not going to be easy to um, achieve the 2030 target or to hit uh, carbon neutrality even in 2045. We have a lot of work cut out for us. There's, there's going to be, um, there's going to, we're going to need a lot of investment, a lot of partnerships. Um, there's going to be, we're going to need much more engagement by the private sector. It's going to have to be a whole of government, whole of society approach. And I think one of the challenges that we really have to keep front and center is how to ensure that um, whatever approaches we're taking are also um, advancing the equity agenda. So you'll see in the scoping plan, the draft scoping plan, that carbon capture and sequestration and direct air capture are a couple of the strategies that the state would employ in order to hit carbon neutrality in 2045. Um, Communities, especially in the Central Valley, where that storage, that carbon storage would happen, are concerned. They're not sure, like, is there enough data to show that this is a safe technology? And so I think we really have to be careful in threading that needle and ensuring that the steps we take to achieve our climate goals are prioritizing low-income communities, communities of color, and ensuring that um, the, the efforts we make are simultaneously uplifting communities that have been disadvantaged historically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Veronica, maybe you could um, jump on that point around just the critical nature of really having equity drive climate action and you really can't have decarbonization unless you have equity. Um, yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I do want to talk for a minute about um, just some of the things that, um, I don't know, we're facing in, in the regions across the state um, with respect to climate and the impacts of climate. So there are a lot of things that we do um, around the state that are sort of band-aids uh, created to address that immediate need when we are in the middle of wildfire season. Um, or we are having um, uh, unseasonable heat. And so there are some programs that, that are funded on the state program, some of them on the federal program um, to protect uh, communities, um, particularly overburdened communities. Um, but um, I, I wanted to take a step towards um, talking, uh, you know, again about um, AB 32 and, you um, what has led um, our air district and other air districts to trying to understand um, granular uh, pollution. So, um, you know, as a lot of folks out there know, um, um, there was a, a bill passed in 2017, AB 617, that was intended to address localized air pollution in communities that host cap and trade facilities. Um, it's been a, um, an incredible journey for us and all of the things that I talked about before about being discomfort, having discomfort and, and power sharing all came out through this process. But I mention it because um, um, it's, um, oh God, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, uh, there have been uh, calls from um, community groups, from people specializing in community health like PSRLA and others um, who have been pushing um, CARB and have been pushing um, the air districts and the state government to um, prioritize health. Um, and by prioritizing health um, in those communities that are hosting cap and trade facilities, um, and it's not limited to those communities, but those are kind of the most visible um, communities where we're doing, uh, working on 8617 work. Um, it's incredible, it's important to um, um, implement uh, program evaluation and it's and among chief among you know things that we might measure are um, uh, reduction in emissions and improvement in public of public health and I don't think that the legislation necessarily requires that and so um, it's important for the air districts and for CARB to really listen to um, figure out um, how we prioritize health and how we use health as an indicator of the success of the program. Um, you know, CARB, it has its own um, research division. We do not, but we do a lot of research around um, 
um, equity and health. Um, I think it's going to be, um, you know, more important for agencies like CARB um, and Cali PA, and it's important for um, elected officials and the governor to include that kind of um, uh, funding in their budgets and that kind of a mandate um, that we are addressing health um, uh, or um, looking into uh, improvement of health as we evaluate whether or not the program has been a success. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll end it there. Great, thank you. Marta, can you give us a, a specific tangible example from your work in LA about how health considerations, community health considerations can drive good climate planning and policy and investments? Yeah, no, for sure. Or, or maybe um, I actually wanted to start with an example of how not to do it, right? Um, okay, yeah, before, go for it. before I go there, I did want to lift up the way Veronica and others have the 30 plus years of work of environmental justice organizations that have brought health and equity to the forefront of the environmental movement. The environmental movement started, you know, as we all know, protecting the environment. And we all then came to this realization that we had to unite health and equity to, in, in order to save the planet, we have to also save the people. So I just kind of want to lift up the EJ organizations there. And then um, in terms of research, I think the main goal of our research should be to prevent false solutions to ensure that we're maximizing our resources and we're not investing in solutions that may actually create unintended consequences. And in terms of the example that you're asking me for, I wanted to lift up cap and trade because I was actually, uh, trivia here, I was actually at Communities for a Better Environment decades ago when cap and trade was originally being considered. And our main you know, uh, objection to it was we felt that there was gonna be a disproportionate impact on low-income communities. And lo and behold, decades later, that's what we discovered. There was a disparate impact of uh, pollution burden on communities where, where the refineries and the polluters existed. So that's an example of uh, a climate solution that didn't work out uh, for not just for everyone, but specifically for those communities. So it would be great for the UCs to be able to take on some of the stronger, more um, technologies that are building momentum and take a neutral stand on those technologies and be able to look at it through certain criteria that will weigh the, the benefits and the costs to society and to public health so that we don't go down that road again. We have, we've learned too many lessons from investing in um, false solutions and technologies that, that don't pan out, right? So I think UC is already doing a great job on, on trying to ensure that we don't um, invest in false solutions. The other thing that I wanted to mention in terms of um, research is I think we're all trying to figure out what equitable investments really are. And for example, we have a UC fellow at CIMO right now that is um, studying the evolution of our office, but also the the um, impact of our programs and how engaging they are in order to transform city policies. So we're fortunate enough to have a UC fellow who is extremely capable. Her name is Emma French. And I, it, it's a gift for our office to have someone like that on board, but we need a ton of people like that that are at offices like mine and like John's that um, are just starting out, but can then advocate for more resources so we can have that larger impact. And I, I wanna just take this moment to pitch that even though our office is also small, I think our, our, our magic is in bringing this collaborative approach and catalyzing initiatives and campaigns within the city with the power that's been given to us by the mayor and the council, right? And so that that itself has given me the ability to work with the emergency management department, the public health department at the county, um, the planning department at the city of LA and the board of public works, all of us kind of working together to affect change and maximizing the investments that will be arriving from the climate dollars that exist at the state level. Um, and in terms, you asked an earlier question, how can we make sure those investments are effective? Um, one thing that I haven't heard that I, that I believe 
is we have to ensure that our administration, our procurement, our accountants are all on the same page and that they help us execute those dollars in a way that that does make a difference for the most affected communities. Um, and our office is trying to have that conversation, not to, we are having that conversation within the city of LA and I think we're making progress in, in changing that process for these climate investments. So I'm hoping I answered your question, Pauline. You did, yeah. And thank you for your really pushing this all of government approach and also earlier um, in your response, really uplifting the important critical role that the EJ orgs have played for years. We wouldn't be having this conversation today, even though it's a conversation really among government leaders at different levels of government. It, it takes the ecosystem and the EJ orgs have been critical to that, um, especially here in California. So, um, so thank you. Um, so we have um, one more question, um, and I'm going to just have it, it can be just kind of more free flowing, anyone can answer it, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily like have an order, um, because I want to just get a little bit more specific around how the university, so including health um, professionals, researchers, and students, you just mentioned the student, Marta, how we can contribute to your work as policymakers to advance health equity and climate action. I'll start again. Um, I really feel like organizational development analysis for new offices like mine that are now actually combining heat, not just you know overall climate hazards, but heat specifically because it's a primary hazard for Los Angeles. Um, it'd be great to have folks who are expert in, in analyzing that support our work to ensure that we're using best practices to develop our offices. And that will hopefully help catalyze more and additional funding to come to our offices in the way that um, we envisioned and we intended. I think that would be something super valuable. And we hope to do that, <laughs> as you know, at the UCLA Less Consider for Innovation, uh, as well as many other entities um, connected to this UC Center. Thank you, Marta. Um, uh, others have thoughts on like specific examples of really how the university can help you sure i just uh i'll go i have my hand up um i just wanted to lift up for a minute the center for regional chain change out of um uc davis they have a really great model um you know they, as you know my fellow panelists may know but they you know have a, a steering committee that meets regularly that is comprised of uh, community members and community-based organizations they uh, participate in in developing the research agenda and um and at times also participate in the research and so i think that that kind of a um um collaborative in engagement um resource um is um really successful it generates uh research that is useful um to frontline communities um um, and I imagine also very useful um, for the university. So I was a little bit engaged in that when I uh, was living in San, uh, Sacramento um, in a, another life and working at CARP. And so I, I encourage you all to take a look at that model um, and, and maybe some form of it might be helpful to you. Debt elimination. This is a limited time offer. <laughs> I would just... Um... I would add on to that. I think uh, the an engaged model for research is not the norm nor the comfort. I would generally say for universities, and I and I'm speaking from uh, when we developed a climate change research program at the Strategic Growth Council. Our goal was okay. What? Why? Well, first of all, the question was sort of how did this end up with us, and then we thought, okay, well, what would make it an SGC approach? What would be grounded in equity? And it would be driving towards on the ground solutions. But the only way to get there is through true meaningful partnership between research and community from concept development through execution, through presentation of results, full circle, right? The whole process. Um, and to develop that program, we did extensive outreach with communities and with the universities. Um, and long story short, it turned out to be a very successful model. And I think one that we've seen other state agencies take up um, in their work, and uh, you know, I think likely will be reflected in the next California climate change assessment. Uh, and so that's, a, I think, a really great model. 
And I think just as we were talking earlier about government sort of quote, unquote, you know, like ceding power or letting go, the university has to do that as well. And that is not a comfortable place for academics typically. And, um, you know, so I just think that is going to be a major challenge. I think what is so exciting about this center being established is trying to create a, a culture and practice around doing that in a space to do that, that is um, really, uh, you know, is, is a model. And so I just think there's a huge opportunity that hopefully, just like you, when you innovate in government, you see it spread throughout other parts of government. And I think that's what we've seen happen with things like the Strategic Growth Council or other models like that, is that we would start to see that also in the research community as well. And that includes you know, funding for community partnership and for community partners, um, recognition and value of, you know, not peer reviewed journal articles, but impact oriented, actionable research. So that's just, I think, a real um, opportunity and need that we have. And I think the urgency of the moment really requires it. I had the opportunity to, to answer this question uh, even more broadly uh, to speak to the CEOs of academic teaching hospitals last week. And, you know, I, I totally agree with what everything that you're saying. It, there, there's an enormous range. And I, I use the, the WHO framework for resilient health systems as kind of a model for what an academic medical center like UCSF can do. It, UCSF is, of course, one of the world's greatest academic medical centers. It has huge amounts of resources coming into it. It has extensive outreach into all of the communities in the Bay Area. It's training hundreds, thousands of, of healthcare workers at any given time. So it has tremendous reach. And if you look at the framework, you know, there, there's a research piece. And, and I won't repeat what you said, Louise. I, I, I think exactly what you said is right. Out in the community, impact-oriented, evaluated, implementation science, you know, show how we actually, you know, walk the walk. Um, education and training, you're already doing it, but, you know, there's... It, it needs to be scaled up. It needs to be made permanent in, in curricula. Um, you know, the data systems that, that the hospital is using can be used in an innovative way. The EH, the electronic health records can be used in ways that start to track where people are living with respect to those social de determinants of health that are related to the built and natural environment in the Bay Area. Where are the heat islands? Where are the flood risks? Where, you know, where, where are those kind of risks? Um, you know, innovation in low carbon healthcare delivery, innovation in, in climate resilient healthcare delivery. You know, you have the resources, you're building new buildings all the time. Uh, you're doing it. Uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an important role. And then the last thing is, is just the leadership and, uh, you know, the leadership at all levels. I, I want to commend you, the UC Health System. Um, you are one of the signers to our healthcare sector pledge, uh, or at least intending to. And that's, that's the kind of leadership you know, that, that starts to lift the sector as a whole. Um, and I'll just jump in to say, I think there's so many ways this center and the UC system will be integral, will continue to be integral to the work of the state. Um, and I think this could include policy relevant research, advising on specific topics in real time, educating students um, about the intersections of climate and health equity, and also really importantly, bringing students and workers into the state system, students and workers who are well informed about these issues that come in with like a baseline level of understanding of how important these topics are. Um, and to give a couple specific ideas, I think engaging with the various environmental, environmental justice structures that exist within state agencies and processes would be a super helpful starting place. Um, I mentioned earlier that CARBs, CARB has an EJ advisory committee, which was originally stood up to um, guide decision making on the scoping plan, but it's going to become a permanent structure going forward, working on a variety of CARB related issues. And meeting with that committee to hear the topics that those committee members are most interested in and will be able to best uh, inform their engagement with their communities, I think that would be a super helpful um, way, way for the center to engage. In terms of specific topics, I mentioned earlier car carbon capture and sequestration and the potential health risks associated with leaks of stored carbon, if that were to happen, or the ability for um, CCS technologies to scrub 
other co-pollutants take other, you know, NOx and SOx out of the air at the same time as taking carbon out of the air. Um, another topic that comes up a lot that we hear a lot is pesticides and the greenhouse gas emissions and health impacts associated with them. So I think there's, you know, in the center talking with uh, state related EJ groups and EJ advisors, I think there's going to be a lot of topics that um, will be helpful, will be really helpful for the center to help us advance. If, if I could just have 15 seconds, I just want to tag on to what Shereen was saying, something that has been mentioned but, but could be elevated. UCSF has this amazing um, strength in occupational and environmental health research. And as we look at the transition, as we look at, you know, the lithium economy, as we look at, uh, you know, the renewable solar panels, as we look at all these new technologies, there are really important unanswered questions about safety, the carbon sequestration being one of, of many. And I think a center like UCSF can really get that. that that's, a, that's a place where the health equity comes in, right? Because who are the people who are going to be involved in those industries? It's going to be many of the same people on front lines of other kinds of environmental and occupational exposure. So that's a really important place there is, is getting ahead of the transition uh, to the clean energy economy and making sure that it does not res that doesn't perpetuate uh, these inequities and exposures and health health burdens. Yeah, I want to echo what what has been said by John, Shireen, and Louise. Um, getting a little bit more basic, for example, in California and Los Angeles, we undercount um, the hospitalizations due to heat exposure or environmental exposure to methane or gas. And that is because our doctors aren't trained in, in these areas. But from a public health perspective, we, we know that, we know that well. Um, and so how can we yeah, integrate the knowledge that we have on the environmental health, public health, and to the intake at these clinics and hospitals so, we, so that we can get better baselines and know whether or not we're actually improving with our investments in reducing these, these heat-related or climate-related or pollution-related hospitalizations. Um, that's always been something that has gnawed at me and we've never been able to like do that paradigm shift with our doctors in the hospitals. But um, I think we're getting closer and I don't want us to miss that opportunity. I think the UC system and, and this program in particular can really, this center in particular can really help us tip it over so that we are effective in tracking and monitoring those kinds of health issues and hospitalizations. Yes, absolutely. Oh, thank you all for your insights and comments there. I feel like every topic that just came up and kind of that lightning round mm -hmm. um, set of sessions could be its own a one hour discussion. And so clearly we had a tremendous lot to cover in a short amount of time. And I think it just really underscores that this is hopefully the beginning, the series for which this panel is the last of, 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 of the series is really just the beginning of, of a process and a lar much larger conversation that this new UC Center will help facilitate. And um, I just want to end by, by of course, thanking the panelists. Um, such an amazing panel. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. And, and then re, I want to reiterate the message that, that really we're all in this together and kind of this need for collaboration and bridge building across sectors. As this new UC Center will build bridges, may we all individually and institutionally support the center in that effort and strive to do the same, right, as we advance health and equity centered climate action together. So thank you once again, and I'm now going to turn it over to Ariane to close things out. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen, for moderating and for this amazing panel, for their vision, for sharing their guidance for the center and, and really an inf insightful and inspiring session. Um, this closes uh, the launch of the University of California Center for Climate, Health and Equity. We are hugely grateful that we are building the center amidst the collaboration with the collective wisdom and inspiration of so many partners and leaders. Thank you to all the speakers and viewers who have joined us over the past two days. Um, who have joined us over the past two days, we have heard calls to action in each conversation, we've heard calls to hope, words for guidance for how 
our center and the UC system can best support the climate and health movement. As we close this event, we take these words to heart and we look forward to partnering with many of you who have joined us. Um, and also, I want to take a moment on behalf of Sherry and myself and thank you for being here. We want to take a moment to thank Naomi deeply for all of her tireless work putting together this launch. We are immensely grateful for her vision and her thought around this launch. And we are also thankful to our amazing team um, of Jennifer Monroe Zakaras, Tiffany Wade, and Carly Hampshire for helping just this whole year and along the way. Um, this launch is a uh, first in a series of events and new initiatives we are launching as a part of the new center. Please visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, and follow us on social media for updates about our work and how we can feature yours. Um, and please reach out to partner with us, and we hope to work with many of you in the years ahead. And I just wanted to add my gratitude to the speakers and panelists for your insight, guidance, and hopefully collaboration for many years to come. Um, and also adding my gratitude to our wonderful team. For the viewers, we are really looking forward to your collaboration, helping us move forward this vision and mission we all have towards developing a more equitable and sustainable world. Thank you.